Hello, David Simpson, and nice to see you here in the Donetsk city in the January 2016. Um, you're from Seattle, USA, uh, quite a long way to come here to, to Donbass. Uh, can you let, tell a little bit for the, for the Donai News Agency, and for me personally, Janusz Putkonen, too, from yourself? Sure, it's a pleasure to be here, Jens. Um, I was in Seattle. And obviously, I didn't like what was happening here and the way things were happening by my own country. So I decided to come and try and help any way possible. Okay. Um, you have a history. And, uh, and in the USA, you, you have been publicly criticizing USA and the Western, Western policies. But what exactly brings you down here to Donbass? Well, it's sort of a long situation in the USA. Um, I sat around for several years watching what was happening here, and the first opportunity I had to come, I took advantage of it and came here. But the, the factors that motivated me were fundamentally how the U.S. became involved in the affairs here. Uh, this country does not border the USA. Um, there are no real economic ties that uh, historically have been between Ukraine and the U.S., maybe between Russia and the Ukraine, but not the U.S. and the, uh, Ukraine. Um, but the more I started seeing American tax dollars being spent to bomb people, kill people here, and not just here, Afghanistan, Iraq, all over the globe, it's becoming the American business model to export death and destruction rather than any, anything that really is productive and helps people. And the more I saw the damage to people here, the more I knew I had to come and try and help. Uh, what I understand that you have came over here to stay, that you are not... Absolutely. Seeking to, to uh, go we, back to U.S. Yeah. <laughs> if you're an American and you make a, a decision like this, it's not very reversible. There are a number of laws that the administration has to try and punish people so that they don't make that step. And if I were to go back to the U.S., it would be a long stay in jail, and they would consider me a terrorist. But I decided that no matter what, it was worth the risk to try and come here and help. Uh, what if you are a USA citizen and you go help the Nazi, Nazi uh, Azov Battalion? It's the you same. Know, that's a good question because there are actually people who have gone from the U.S. and helped uh, Nazi battalions in Ukraine and returned to the U.S. without prosecution. The United States justice system has what's called selective prosecution, so they can decide to go after somebody or not decide. But in most all cases that I've heard or that I'm aware of, um, anybody who has helped the fascist forces or the Nazi forces in Ukraine has been able to come back to the USA without any fear of prosecution. So when you go to the people's side, you are a terrorist, but when you go to the Nazi side, you are a, when what you are then? You are a liberator. <laughs> you have an open door. You're a liberator. You could come and go as you please. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, U.S. Congress just made a decision from, from uh, they, they have bombing this question upside mm -hmm. down. The, the first day they say that it's not uh, allowed to give finance for these, these uh, nationalist battalions, mm -hmm. but, but now they, they turn it upside down and they are again funding these yes, aid so it's, it's unreal. I mean, most Americans like to think that their country doesn't spend money on Nazis in order to help. Um, it's really kind of the strangest occurrence that you could imagine in a democracy, but our tax dollars are being sent over here to finance bombing men, women, children, and to assist Nazi forces. There was a bill in Congress that was designed, as I'm sure you know, to stop the funding to the Nazi battalions, and so they wouldn't have any American tax dollars being spent. But at the last moment, Congress took that out, and now the money will go to the Nazis to help them kill innocent people in Donbass. That's not monitored in the Western mainstream media. No, it's not. <laughs> a lot in the US uh, and in the Western mainstream media doesn't make it out at all. I had, a, a, as I told you, um, another time, we had a friend back in the U.S. who lives in the center of the country, Midwest, and he mentioned, uh, can you tell me something that's happening over there because we never see anything on our television back here in the news about what happens in Donbass or the Ukraine. Even that USA is involved highly in the, in the situation in Ukraine, there is nothing in the U.S. media. My friends did not even know about it. That's how, how, how much it's blacked out in the West. <laughs> so it's a secret war it in is, the U.S. It, it, but, you know, you're exactly correct. It is a secret war. Um, you have been, when we talk about these governmental issues, you have been uh, official in the U.S. 
U.S. Yeah, I worked for system. I worked for the U.S. I worked at one point for three years for the Central Intelligence Agency and the U.S. Office of Naval Intelligence. I worked with both those agencies to procure weapon systems in Russia for U.S. test and evaluation. In order to try and protect American servicemen 25 years ago, part of what we did was try and get Russian weapon systems and test them to see what our forces would go up against, for example, if they invaded Iraq or other countries. You so, were in Baltics. Yes, I was in Riga for three years, and I brought weapon systems out of there to the U.S. Uh, it's uh, very uh, nice, of course, for us, it's too nice mm -hmm. to see a C ex CIA officer uh, helping helping us here. Uh, you s I have heard that you you speak good Russian and uh, you have uh, some uh, this Baltic state uh, works. Uh, tell me a little bit your yeah, your background. With there. Yes, that's correct. Um, when I lived there for three years, I uh, worked as I said with the U.S. government to get weapon systems for them. We were licensed by the Department of the Treasury. I had involvement with agents from the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Uh, routinely worked back and forth with the uh, CIA and ONI on things that would be of interest to them. We worked with, in Russia, in Moscow, with people from their uh, Ministry of Heavy Weapons. So it was not a surprise to the Russians. They knew who I was when I came through on the way here. Mm -hmm. So that was not a surprise. But yes, I do know a lot of Russians. I, uh, my first wife, for example, was Russian. Um, I, I spent a lot of years around Russians. So I do, I do have the ability to speak Russian just a little. Uh, so... How, what is your, how you think uh, Donetsk and Donbass area uh, separating from the Russian? Do you, do you see a difference here? Well, what I see here are people that are basically from here. There, there are ethnic Russians in the area, but it's not as the Western media says, where there are battalion after battalion after division of Russian forces stationed here. You don't have that. You may have individual Russian volunteers, just like I'm an American volunteer, yeah. but you do not have complete units of them stationed here that have come here from Russia to fight anybody. This is really a, a local group of people that are trying to maintain their freedom and have their own country. Uh, in my eyes, you are uh, at least fifth uh, from the USA who have come here to help Donbas. Um, how, you, how you see that, uh, the, why USA people uh, have this will to, to come to the Russian world? Well, Americans have always had a tradition of supporting uh, the underdog. Americans don't like watching people be oppressed or kicked around, especially when they're a minority, for example. And these people went and they had a referendum, they had a free election, and in normally what would happen is, is you go to the United Nations and you have your own country. It becomes very simple. It's a real simple process. If you have an open election like this and people say they want to be independent and free, you go to the UN and you submit your paper and you become a country. This is one of the only situations in history I can even think of where the West goes completely amnesic and refuses to see anything about this place and them having legitimate elections and wanting to have their own country, which is exactly what happened. And how they are able to deny this is only because they're able to control the media in the West and make sure most Americans never hear anything about what's happening here. I understand. Uh, so what is your personal goal? Uh, here, you have come here to stay to the Donetsk uh, Republic, and um, how, what, how you see yourself uh, helping to save Donbas people? Well, I'll do my best any way I can, whether it's involved in something like uh, uh, analyzing uh, information or intelligence and passing on information, or for example, if there becomes a situation where we are constantly facing NATO or anything involving a situation where English is needed, I think I can help in those areas. I can also help in the media area. I certainly have a background in the United States in university education, as well as in law and politics. So I'd like to be able to try and help the government any way I can here. As a last resort, like just about anybody I've met here, I'm more than willing to walk to the front uh, with a weapon and take up arms to stop people from hurting people here. So you are uh, from the university, you are also ready to even go to the trenches. Absolutely, absolutely. That, that is something that's necessary in any society to protect freedom and protect innocent people. There's never been a case in history that's more black and white than this. This is a case of really strong major forces in the West trying to intimidate and destroy any chance of these people having freedom. So you have a lawyer education, too. I spent some time studying law, absolutely, yeah. yes. Criminal justice at Indiana University. I spent maybe four years there studying it. What do you think about the international law today? I think they completely ignore it. I think if you were to take this to the International Criminal Court, this is certainly a case for these people to have a right to their own freedom. There have certainly been war crimes committed here, terrible war crimes by Kiev. 
and American tax dollars are paying for them, which is one of the reasons I got on a plane and got out of there, is because it is simply uh, it goes against my moral version of, of reality to continue to pay taxes every week or two to the U.S. government that come here and finance the death of children, the veterans of the war. It's just absurd. I see. Um, and you the last section about this USA in, in, in intervention in, in the geopolitical. Mm -hmm. Why the Maidan coup was backed by USA? Why U.S. is uh, making this intervention in, in, the, in the, how you see mm -hmm. the, the, the main uh, core reason? Yeah, it's a, it's a business model the U.S. has developed. It's, it's, like a, it's like a corporation. The U.S. is like a business, and what it tends to export nowadays is death and destruction. Instead of exporting help and democracy, now we export death and destruction. We go to countries, we deliver weapon systems, we deliver death, we kill people, and then we take resources and try and profit from them. Newland is one of the first people to actually open her mouth and admit it. I mean, she didn't really publicly because she didn't know she was being taped, but when she said that the United States put $5 billion on the table to buy the situation in the Ukraine, that's the truth. And now we all know that that is the business model the U.S. is using all over the place. They've tried it in Armenia, other countries. They go in and what they do is destabilize the regime. And then behind them come all the corporations to try and make money off the resources and the population. They come in and open the McDonald's. They come in and pump your oil. They come in and steal your coal. And that's basically why they'd like to have Donbass at the end of the day. They'd like to have the Ukraine whole so they can come in and exploit the resources. There's a reason the vice president's son is working for one of the Ukrainian corporations. It's called greed and profit. Here in the Donetsk, you have seen, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but the, the, all the McDonald's are closed. Oh, I'm, I'm heartbroken. <laughs> I, think, I think we'll live with that. You can live with that. I can live with that. Yeah. All the banks are also closed. Well, there's, uh, I mean, we'll get around that. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the information and, um, and interview. Anything? I, I, um, Warmly welcome you to the Donetsk Re People's Republic, and uh, hope to to you to have a good struggle together for the common values. Thank you.